So let's get this, um, this show started. And um, we'll do that by welcoming a familiar friend of the Agile movement and also of Agile People Sweden. Uh, he's a writer, entrepreneur, leader, trainer, and much, 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 much more. And he spent a career in uh, pioneering management. He's here to talk about scaling agility. And he's Jürgen Apelo. Please welcome. Thank you. There we go. While we get your computer set up, yes. um, you, um, and there's a lot of things going on here, but uh, we, we, we'll manage that. Yeah. You keep coming back. Yeah, yeah, to agile people, Sweden. <laughs> people can get and rid of me. <laughs> and it's not that we don't want it. So <laughs> rather the opposite. Wh why do you come back? Because you travel the because globe. Because always places. ask me so nicely. <laughs> 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 it's good to have nice friends. Yes, exactly. I oh, don't want to disappoint her. No, right. it's, it's an important topic. We have uh, agile leadership, agile marketing, agile management, agile, agile people, uh, HR, uh, etc. There's uh, lots of agile stuff going uh, going on. And uh, let me let me help you here because this is it's Windows after all, so you have to restart it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. All right. All right, but I'll I'll probably uh, just leave so the stage to you. But yeah, you yeah. Keep so coming uh, back. It's important yeah, yeah. topic. It's uh, lots of things going on in the agile world, and I'm happy to be part of it. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. And and in one word, if you would summarize <laughs> the change from the first agile people Sweden you you attended to now. Agile. <laughs> it's, it's a good, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good proof. All right, I'll leave the floor to you. All right, thanks. Thanks. So, all right, where's my glass of water? Over here. I, uh, I saw when I came here that we're on a ship, and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I'll have to make sure everyone laughs at my jokes evenly or else we might capsize, <laughs> things like that. And I saw uh, when I entered the ship, uh, everything here is self-organized, and I thought, oh my god, <laughs> there's usually, uh, usually uh, 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 organizers saying, we were too lazy to arrange everything for you, do it yourself. <laughs> but, uh, but not in this case, I, th I think it's well organized actually so far. Happy to, happy to see that not everything is left, is left to us. Um, this, this word agile, it comes up again and again. Let me start with the ugliest slide that I have to, to get, get that out of the way. Um, I stole it from the State of Agile Report by version 1. Uh, they do this report every year and uh, they uh, measure, among many other things, what are the uh, challenges that people experience with, with agility around the world. And the ones that stand out to me are these. Uh, the company philosophy and culture are at odds with agile values. The culture is not what we need in, in a company that wants to, uh, to be more agile. And also there is a, a resistance to change with this adoption, uh, adoption of these new ideas. How many, of you, uh, how many of you recognize that, that people resist agile thinking, resist the agile mindset? All right, look at that. Lots of hands going up. All right, so people resist change. This, this comes up again and again, no matter where, no matter where I go. Um, I find that interesting. I find that interesting. How many of you have resisted this change? Smartphones. <laughs> One, two, <laughs> three, or right, four maybe. All right. Keep it up. You're the heroes here. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> Dig yourself in. <laughs> How many of you have resisted this change? Games on tablets or 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 phones or Facebook or whatever. Oh, this is pretty, pretty, pretty good number. That is one third of the audience. Okay, so not a very gameful, gameful culture we have here. All right, we'll talk about that in a moment. How many of you have resisted this change? Streaming audio and video, Spotify, Netflix, iTunes, etc., etc. How many of you are not using any any streaming entertainment? All right, one, two, three, four people, similar to to smartphones. Okay. Okay, so people resist change, seriously? <laughs> You're kidding me? And I think anyone who resists, uh, says that people resist change is, is uh, sorry, no, no, I don't mean incompetent, I mean incognizant. That is that mean people, people do not realize what it is that, 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 that makes others change their behaviors, adopt, uh, adopt new ideas. Because there's plenty of change going on around us and we happily buy into those changes except for, 
for uh, uh, people. <laughs> so uh, everyone wants to, everyone's agility is skill, but nobody knows how to do it. That is sort of my, 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 uh, my conclusion from my travels around, around the world. Um, I did a bit of digging around earlier this year into the trends in workplaces. This is particularly interesting for the Agile people, Agile HR uh, participants uh, here. I read the, uh, the, the report by Boston Consulting Group and Accenture and Deloitte and, uh, and, and, and all those others, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Mm -hmm. They all have their research globally among, among HR and management, etc. And, and this is what I found as the, the conclusions, the patterns across all those reports. I'm not going to read them out to you. you I'm sure you'll be able to download the slide deck later on. But uh, this is what, what I found interesting. Organizational agility was specifically mentioned by basically all of them. Right? CEOs, top managers, HR, they want the organization to be more agile. It is a hot topic. 93% of CEOs said that organizational agility was top of mind at that, at that level. That's great. That's great. But how do we achieve it? That's, uh, that's a big challenge. How do we get that change in the organization? Let me show you some, uh, some interesting uh, clips that I, that I found. Anyone uh, remember this? <laughs> I don't hear the sounds. Oh, we didn't switch the sounds. Sorry about that. Let me check. All right, let's, let's try again. Uh. Whoops. <gasps> Now it's stuck. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <sighs> come on. Je peux me transformer ah. comme je le veux. Regardez. Hup, hup, hup. Hup, hup, hup. And then he says, Barba truc. Barba truc. Right. <laughs> so this is Barba Papa. Was Barba Papa popular in Sweden? Yes. yes. <laughs> it was popular in Holland as well. It turns out it was a, a French cartoon. I never knew that because it was. It was all translated, of course, for the children. But uh, Barba Papa could change into any form. That was so awesome. <laughs> he, could, he could escape from, the, from a fence, uh, through a fence in the, in the zoo where he was captured. Here's another one that is probably more familiar to, to some of you. Hello, Quark. Anyone remember him? Odo, Odo from? Which one? Deep Space Nine. Well, right, Deep Space Nine. Which species? <laughs> the Changelings, right. And they were part of the? Uh, the Great Link. <laughs> the Great Link and the Dominion. Wow, we have an expert in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the Changelings, they were a nasty species. They were, they were not so friendly. They wanted all the other species in the galaxy basically to look up to them and, and admire them, otherwise they would blast their planets out of the galaxy, sort of a United States in space. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but, but Odo was a nice one. Odo was a nice one. He was a security agent at, at the space station. He was always after Quark, because Quark was always smuggling things. And then it is handy when you can disguise as a chair <laughs> or disguise as a, disguise as a dog. Um, this, this is one I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Ooh. Who was that? Terminator. Terminator. Which one? Model number? T-1000. T-1000. All right. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So the T-1000 was, uh, was a self-organizing, uh, was, was shape-shifting entity that could d adopt any form. At one moment, it was solid as steel and punching someone through the face. That was a ghastly scene. I don't know if you remember that. And then other moments, he was dripping from the ceiling behind someone's back. Oh, it was scary. So all of these are examples of shape-shifters. Here's another one, uh, Mystique from, uh, from X-Men. She gets paid a, a two, $20 million for walking around naked. Isn't that unfair? <laughs> I get nothing, I can tell you that. But anyways, 
Um, so uh, these are all shape shifts. I like that, that metaphor of, sh of shape shifting because this is about beings who adopt to the adapt to the environment and, and sometimes they are solid, sometimes they are liquid, sometimes they are square, sometimes they are circles. It depends on, on the environment. So in the, in the 21st century, I think successful organizations need to be hard and soft, fast and slow, solid and liquid and organized and self-organized. For me, that is what, what agility is, uh, is about. So I like this term shapeshifters. Sometimes other people use more difficult terms such as ambidextrous organizations. <laughs> that means right-handed and left-handed, innovative and productive. It's a nice metaphor, but not s thought of by someone who knows about marketing, obviously. So shapeshifter is, I think, a nicer, nicer term. Scaling, uh, scaling the change. Does anyone know about this problem? I'm sure you picked it up somewhere from the news. <laughs> yeah, the British uh, leaving the, the European Union. I thought it was, it, I thought it was funny, uh, a, bit, a bit strange actually. They said that the politicians at that time said, we want to take back our autonomy. Remember that? They want to take back their autonomy. Did they ask any of you here in the room if it was okay? They didn't ask me <laughs> for my position, for permission. They just, they just went. <laughs> they said, okay, we're out, bye. <laughs> so if you can single-handedly decide to take back your autonomy, then you've never lost it, have you? <laughs> you already had it in the first place. <laughs> you didn't ask somebody else, can I get it back? No, you just, okay, bye. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, that's interesting. They never lost the autonomy. I think that's a good thing, by the way, that people can just take back autonomy when they decide. Though the British, I think, and many seem to agree, have not made a good decision there because some decisions are better when you make them in a central location. It is more efficient, it is smarter to do some things at the European level. Like I came here by, by, by air, and by, for uh, uh, pilots, it is useful to know that uh, uh, air traffic rules are consistent across the European continent. <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> if you fly across seven countries in three hours, uh, that it is all uh, the, same, uh, the same rules. So um, it makes sense to have something centralized. Like, and, and, and I delegate uh, my uh, autonomy, my decision making to other people all the time. Like I have a personal assistant who books my hotels and my flights. I, I, uh, the, 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 the furniture in, in our house is, is bought by my spouse. I have absolutely no idea what is the difference between Art Deco, Art Nouveau, Art Dono, or whatever. <laughs> I just know it is all equally expensive. I can see that on the bank account. Um, other things I do not delegate because I want to make those decisions like which uh, streaming technologies we use in our house, for example. I think that is very, very important. <laughs> we use Google Chromecast, uh, we use Spotify Connect, we use uh, Sonos, we use everything basically. I think that is a very important decision. <laughs> so not delegating that. Um, so it depends what I want to delegate and what not. So I trust sometimes that other people make the better decisions than I do. I also have no capacity to do everything myself. Like I said, oh my God, we're going to self-organize here. My God, that means I have to do everything myself. No, thank God, no. Some things are organized well by, uh, by uh, PM Marie and everyone, everyone else here. Um, and there is such a thing, by the way, as decision fatigue. People, are, people get tired of making decisions about everything. We want others to take control in some areas. But, and this is what is good about the British thing, we have the power to change any arrangement, or we should. We should be able to say, all right, that's it. Now I'm going to do it myself. Like, I am able to say to my PA, thank you so much for two years, was wonderful working together, next month I will do it myself again. And I have that power. And for me, it is important, number four, to be able to do this rapidly, to make that change. Like Barba Papa or the T-1000 or Odo can change any form and can do so rapidly. That is the issue with the British now, right? Because leaving is a very, very, very painful aff uh, affair. And I'm sure you can bet on it that they will be back <laughs> after a while. Uh, because it is too uh, uh, annoying to be on your own. I'm quite sure of it. Um, and then there's, there's even more work. 
So uh, it is balancing, uh, and some people might might recognize these uh, these uh, numbers from uh, Manager 3.0, my my uh, agile leadership, agile management brand. There's too much happening on this side of the scale, command and control. I agree, too much, too much in in many organizations. There are too much. Uh, 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 bureaucracy, too much rules imposed on people, and that is why there is this this pendulum swings in the other direction for for many. That we have more self-organizing teams, which is good. We have people make their own decisions, be empowered. But frankly speaking, I'm a lot of agile conferences and scrum gatherings, etc. And sometimes I get the idea that the ideal organization is one happy crowd of 30,000 people self-organizing and dot voting hippies. <laughs> and I think that is not what agile is. For me, this is agility. <laughs> being able to change back and forth, being able to switch depending on context. Sometimes you need to give instructions, sometimes you need to self-organize and dot vote as a team. That swi switching back and forth, that is, I think, what agility is all about. So I prefer to call that self-balanced instead of, instead of self-organized. And, um, uh, and that is something that we need to, to, need to do uh, and need to learn more about. So let's look in, in, in this uh, why people change thing. Because we've seen everyone wants agility at scale. We know that, uh, now know that agility is, is balancing the powers uh, that, uh, that be and taking back control when you want, but you don't want that all the time. Sometimes you're quite happy with somebody else making decisions uh, for everyone. Now, uh, how do we introduce such ideas in the organization? I was, um, uh, I was last year, um, I had my own uh, book uh, out, Managing for Happiness, not as awesome as P uh, Pia Maria's new book, Agile People, of course, um, but uh, I was promoting it in, in the US. When will you have your US tour, uh, Pia Maria? Is it upcoming? <laughs> We're gonna arrange it for you. <laughs> So um, I was, uh, I had managed my own, my own tour over there and I was in New York, uh, I remember well, at uh, Union Square in the evening, minding my own business, uh, reading a book or something on a park bench. And there were lots of people around me from all over the world, New York of course, uh, languages, body types and colors and hairstyles, etc. But everyone was playing this game. Pokemon. <laughs> and people were walking around with their smartphones, except for four people in this room, of course. And everyone was hunting for monsters and talking with each other as complete strangers. And then, oh my god, uh, a Snorlax appeared. Run! And then everyone was hunting for the Snorlax because it would be gone in 10 minutes. And I was sitting there on that park bench and I thought, what the hell is going on? I had never seen something like that before. It was completely ri ridiculous. And I also had a little bit of a pity on myself because I thought me and others uh, such as many people in the room are trying so hard to get people to be more agile in companies and we're trying to convince 500 people to adopt Scrum or wh whatever it is and it's so difficult and it takes years. And then within three weeks, millions of people play Pokemon Go. <laughs> it's, it's just not fair. <laughs> I sat there, I was feeling very depressed. How do they do that? My God. So. This is, uh, uh, th but this inspired me at that moment. I thought, I need to understand more about why they do this much more effectively than I do with my ideas. How, how can they get away with, with this so rapidly? And I realized that many, of the many times we introduce ni new ideas, we have a quite traditional approach. Like, starting next week, thou shalt be doing scrum. And these are the rules of Scrum on the clay tablets, right? And rule number one, thou shalt honor thy product owner and Scrum Master. <laughs> and rule number two, thou shalt not kill thy customer. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And uh, these kinds of change programs, they, they, they don't stick that very well. They, they don't work that well. 
I, um, um, I'm a runner nowadays. Uh, the first time I ran was in Stockholm. Do you remember that? We had a Manager 3 workshop. And the first time I decided we, I'm going to go running. So I ran for seven kilometers here around Stockholm. I was in so much pain. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I had to recover for one and a half week. I, I, I had no, uh, there were muscles I never knew existed in, in my body. So I decided I have to start all over and learn how to do this better. So I started reading about running. I read a good number of books, some of them very useful, some of them not so much. But this one stood out uh, because of the following approach that it had. It had um, instructions like, uh, like these, page after page after page after page of phases and stages and instructions and etc. Like in the third week of the second phase on Tuesday you run 10 kilometers and on the Wednesday you have a break and then on Thursday you do a fast run of 7 kilometers. And I, oh my God, I went through, I flipped through the book, I, was, I got demotivated. I was, my God, how can people do this? I got depressed. I, I, I needed a drink. <laughs> it's, it's no surprise that the, the author's name is Jack Daniels, because... <laughs> I think they sell more whiskey with this book. But isn't, isn't this what, what most Agile transformations are like? <laughs> uh, thou shalt be doing this at, and in that week, etc., etc. So, no, we need a more gameful approach, I think. Um, I like this book by Jane McConnell. She said, all the neurological and physiological systems that underlie happiness are fully activated by gameplay. Games make us happy, basically. That's, that's, that's what she said. So we have to figure out what it is that people do in games, in Pokemon and others. That makes them happy. So let's have a look. This is a game, World of Warcraft. People play on average 22 hours per week, World of Warcraft. And this is what they do. They go around and find things and collect artifacts and practice and and they join a team and talk about projects and assign roles and then a new project starts, a scrum project perhaps. Oh, one iteration after the other and then boom, there goes the scrum master, typical scrum team and more iterations and more product developments and ultimately after a while we have something to show to the customer so we go to the customer, he says You're too late, old no, no Typical. More, Typical. Just you and but me. then the customer says, I challenge you to mock or You get a new project. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> That's what people do in games. It's just a lot of work. Jane says in her book, game developers know better than anyone else how to inspire extreme effort and reward hard work. The silly thing is, we game players pay them, the designers, to give us that work and then we do the work and we ask them for more. <laughs> for more work. Imagine how that happens in organizations. <laughs> then people pay us and still we don't want to do the work. <laughs> because it's no fun. <laughs> So, um, gamification is, is the application of game elements and principles in non-game contexts. To improve uh, engagement, organizational productivity, you see that, uh, etc, etc. And um, gamification is different, just to be clear, from serious games. Because um, in my management theory, those stuff, there is also there are some serious games, such as uh, delegation poker and stuff like that. That's Awesome stuff, serious games, but that is playing a game in order to learn something about an organizational context. Gamification is doing your actual work, but then doing it in such a way that you recognize some gaming tricks so that it actually becomes fun. I'll give you some examples. This is a trick called uh, don't break the chain or extending the streak. I just learned this weekend that uh, it uh, exists in Snapchat. My daughter showed me. 
because the longer the, they Snapchat with each other, those kids, the longer the streak becomes, and they have to extend the streak for as long as possible. <laughs> the longest one is, is 900 days or something like, uh, like that, she told me. Um, uh, Seinfeld, the comedian, the US comedian, had something similar. He had a calendar where he ticked off on the calendar if he had made any good jokes that day. And he had to extend the streak, don't break the chain for as long as possible. Write comedy jokes every day. It works marvelously with children. When you want them to do something every day, like brush their teeth, you give them a calendar, you give them a box of stickers, and you tell them, you can take a sticker out of the box and put it on the calendar only when you brush your teeth. Wonders. So that's a gamification example. Now some people have not so smart approaches to gamification. Uh, I was at an event uh, a year ago or something, and someone told me, yeah, we gamify, we gamify the, the people who work in our uh, stores. Uh, was a Dutch telco provider, and uh, uh, they said, uh, we want to uh, incentivize people to give feedback uh, to each other. That was a good idea, good idea. 360 degree feedback among the employees. So they uh, gave them a game on their phones. And the game gave people points when they gave feedback to each other in the store. So, for example, if I think that you could have smiled more to the customer, and I tell you that through the app, ka-ching, I get a point. <coughs> and then you tell him, perhaps, that you could have walked faster to that customer, ka-ching, you get a point. Isn't that amazing? So at the end of the session, I asked the speaker, so um, what, what is the whole goal here? What is it that, that they're trying to do with the app? And he said, well, to be at the top of the leaderboard with the most points. And I asked, okay, but what's the point <laughs> of having the most points? Well, to be at the top of the leaderboard. Okay, okay so we're not going anywhere here, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Um, so, and I asked, um, and by the way, uh, who is participating in this points giving thing uh, with feedback? Is, is management also participating in this? He said, no, no, management does not participate in this. Management just looks at the data and then the leaderboards. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I had a Jean-Luc Picard moment uh, that, uh, in that, uh, at that time. So um, there's this uh, complicated looking but awesome model by Yu Kai Chu called Oxalysis. He uh, analyzed lots of games. He's one of the world's leaders in gamification, thought leaders. And he has an eight point model that looks uh, suspiciously close uh, to my Champ Frogs model, very similar. Same things are on there, only has a nice 2D representation of it. And basically what I just told you is this corner of the diagram status points, achievement symbols, leaderboards, progress bars. Yes, that motivates some people because people like accomplishment. They want to see that they have accomplished something. They want to see progress. But it is only one eighth of this whole model. There's lots more that you can do that is called gamification and has nothing to do with giving people points. But also, the point that Yu Kai Chu was making with his book, it says that many people mistake gamification for points. Oh, let's gamify it. We'll give people points. It is such a poor interpretation of gamification. Let me give you another example. Um, someone told me, Jurgen, we have uh, CUDA cards in the organization, thank you notes, handwritten notes that people give to each other. And it works uh, quite well in many companies, but in some organizations, it just doesn't work. The culture resists it somehow. And so she asked me, how can I increase the number of kudos that people give each other? Because the only kudos card I, I received was the one I wrote for myself. <laughs> um, so I said, well, uh, I know from this book, I learned a trick called magnetic caps. Um, that was, uh, he, I gave an example in that book of a person who asked for people's hobbies on a web form and it was a limitless uh, form, endless uh, number of hobbies you could offer and then on average people typed two hobbies, writing, speaking, submit. And then he thought, what happens if I limit the size of that text box and make it three small text boxes? And then it turned out that people used all three text boxes, writing, speaking, traveling, submit. Ta-da! The response rate just gone up by 50% by reducing the size of that, of that, uh, that, that uh, field on the form. 
And this is an example of a magnetic cap, which is this area of the diagram, scarcity. By making something available uh, less than people want it, more. Right? Scientists have proven this with cookie jars, very simple, same cookies, similar types of jars. If there's this amount of cookies here and this amount of cookies there, most people want those cookies. Because there are only a few co co cookies left, right? So there must be something about those cookies. <laughs> they are rare. So they go for those cookies except for the last one, because that would be impolite, says Swedish, Swedish people don't do that. Only Dutch people would take the last cookie. <laughs> Am I right, Ben? Yeah, of course, yes. Ben and I would fight over the last cookie, I can tell you. Because it's the best one. Um, but uh, yeah, so by, by making an artificial cap, you make it magnetic so that the response rate goes up. I would, I told a person, I would make a limited number of color cards available. Give every person in the company only three cards. It's useless paper, it doesn't matter. Three cards, they become very special. Those are the only three cards you get this week. I'm sure you would see the, the response rate go up. Another uh, example, someone said to me, Johan, we have this Friday afternoon a drink at four o'clock. Fika, it might be here. <laughs> In, uh, in Sweden. Uh, and uh, everyone says it's important to hang out, hang, uh, out with, you, with your friends and, and, and co-workers at the office, but very few people show up. The only ones who show up are basically the agile coaches because they have nothing to do. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> so how, can we, how can we increase the number of people that, that come to the, the, the Friday afternoon uh, Fika thing? I said, well, if I was there, I would be taking a silly selfie with the people who show up at 4 o'clock and make the selfie as silly as possible, right? And we're going to print the selfie and put it in the kitchen or on the coffee machine, whatever, somewhere everyone can see it. And every Friday we take a silly selfie. It, they become sillier all the time. Right? And then when people see those silly selfies, they, they become interested, curious, and they might have suggestions on how to take the selfie even sillier next time. But then they will have to be there, right, to take the selfie. And after five or ten of those selfies, you will see some people are never on the selfie. Right? The social pressure will start to increase. <laughs> Why are you never there? <laughs> You're always missing. Oh, okay, I'll be there this Friday then. So that's social influence. Brag buttons, social prods, everything that you use in the social space as a gamification te technique. I have another uh, silly example from, uh, from my own experience a long time ago. When I was 10 years old, there was this four-day swimming challenge in, uh, in my town. It meant that all the kids of several, of several schools went to the swimming pool, local swimming pool, on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Wednesday, and did 20 laps, 20 laps every night. And it was not an Olympic-sized swimming pool, but it felt like Olympic-sized swimming pool. Okay, trust me, I was 10 years old. Forgive me for that. So it was, it, was, it was quite challenging. So I did 20 laps, 20 laps, 20 laps, 20 laps, and on Thursday I took my medal and I went home. Next year, I was 11, I participated again. I was, uh, did 20 laps on Monday, 20 on Tuesday, 20 on Wednesday, and on Thursday I was so tired. I was so tired, and the swimming pool, for some reason, it got twice as large. It was much larger than the day before. Um, and I already figured out by that time that everyone had to do their own counting because uh, there were no teachers and, and whatever they were not looking. They were in the they were in the bar basically drinking and look. Th is there nobody drowning? All right, fine. They probably just had read Jack Daniel's running book or something. Uh, so uh, they were having drinks, and um, we, we had to count ourselves. So after 16 laps, I looked around me. Nobody was watching. Okay, whatever. I'll, I get out of the pool. I just I'm, I'm drowning here. So uh, I, I took a shower, I dressed, I took a medal, and I went home. And I felt so ashamed of myself <laughs> that I took that medal for something that I had not earned, because I did not do the 20 laps. It was burning in my backpack, I remember, <laughs> I remember that. So I didn't tell anyone, I didn't tell my parents, my friends, nobody. Next year I participated again in the four-day swimming challenge. So on Monday I did 20 laps, Tuesday 20 laps, Wednesday 20, on Thursday I did 24. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. 
So I earned the medal of that year, and also finally I earned the medal <laughs> from the previous year. <laughs> and I felt better about myself. I still didn't tell anyone uh, until 20 years uh, later, when somehow this memory surfaced. And um, so, what part of the model would that be? Well, I think it would be, oops, I think it would be here to give something meaning, right? uh, be your own hero. Values and the storytelling, everything is, is here. It's a very positive kind of, kind of motivator. I think sometimes these extrinsic motivators can bring out the best in people. So it's not always bad, but oh, don't give badges, don't give points, don't give rewards. No, sometimes this brings out the best in a person. I had to teach myself integrity, and I did that with that stupid worthless piece of metal that I, that I took from, from a box. Right? So where is the adventure and fun and organizational change? That I think that is often missing. I don't, I don't see it that, that, that often when, when new ideas are being introduced. And there are awesome, awesome ideas, whether it is Scrum or, or Manchu 3 or Sociocracy 3 or whatever, full of great ideas. But the way we bring those ideas to people, we could do better, I think. So where are the celebrations for achieving new skill levels? Where are the monsters that we can hunt in organizations with, uh, with our smartphones? I don't think we need more frameworks. We need, we need more fun and fireworks in, in companies. That's, uh, that's what I'm after. So, last five minutes. How do people change? As I said, I started running. I did uh, um, uh, two times 16 kilometers this, uh, this weekend. I'm still recovering. Three times a week, uh, 42 in total. Uh, but that's not how I started. I had to build up uh, to, this, uh, to this point. And uh, I learned about the habit cycle. It is mentioned in several books, basically the same circle again and again. Trigger action reward. If you learn how to tweak yourself to follow this pattern, you will be much more successful at introducing new habits in, for yourself and for your team. It, start, it starts with a trigger. Um, the environment influences us, or as sociologist Kurt Lewin said, the behavior of a person is a function of the person and his or her environment. We can use this to our advantage, the environment. So, for example, someone wrote, if you want to learn how to play a guitar, place the guitar next to your favorite chair. So when you make a coffee and you sit in your favorite chair, you're like, hey, a guitar. <laughs> Let's play a little bit. <laughs> make it as easy as possible. So trigger, make the environment trigger your behaviors. Uh, in one of the running books, uh, so, uh, one of them wrote, place your running shoes next to your bed. <laughs> so that when you get out of bed, ta-da, you're in your shoes already. <laughs> <laughs> so the only thing you have to do is get out, or maybe put on a trunk as well. Right? <laughs> Might be safe, or well, Sweden not so much, it doesn't matter here, I think, but rest of Europe, I'm sure. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, tweak the environment, make sure that the environment triggers you. So, for example, if it is hard to get people to do retrospectives because you're sending people to another room where they normally are not, that is a, a change that is too difficult. Maybe you should start this habit near the coffee machine where people are already convening every day. Uh, that, that makes it easier. So let's, let's use the environment to our advantage. See what it can, how it can trigger you. The second part is tiny habits. Reduce the habit to the smallest possible thing. One thing I picked up in one of those running books, uh, uh, one of the authors said, when you put on those shoes, just walk around the house. That's it. For the first week, just walk around the house. Because the idea is you get used to wearing those shoes and hopefully the short and trunk. Uh, shirt. So, um, th this is not about running 12 kilometers the first week. No, it's building up a habit. You will get there with 12 kilometers later, later on. Reduce it to the smallest possible thing. So, maybe the first retrospectives are just five minute chats near the coffee machine. So, what do you think we could do better this week? Sip. Um, uh, I think this or that sucks. Another sip. That's a retro that you're having right there, right? It's a mini, mini retro. That's where it starts. 
And then the next part, the last part, is convenience and, uh, and enjoyment. Uh, it has to end with the reward. If the habit cycle does not end with the reward, you're not going to start it again, or it is much less likely. So it has to feel rewarding. Now, some th changes come easy to us because they are immediately rewarding. Like, I switched to using Uber because the very first time it was already rewarding. I did not have, I didn't need cash, and the taxi is going to pick me up instead of me having to find them somewhere in the city. That's convenient. So, immediate reward. Uh, same with streaming platforms, etc. The reward is immediate. But what about running? There's no reward. It's just annoying. <laughs> that first run, and it remains annoying for months. <laughs> it takes a while for you to feel great the rest of the day because you did 10 kilometers, but that's not the first cycle. So that's where the gamification comes in, right? You have to reward yourself. You have to find a placeholder reward, enjoyment. Like in the beginning, I had this rule, if I did a run, then on that day I could have a chocolate. I earned the chocolate, and I live in Brussels, so there's plenty of chocolate to go around where I come from. Uh, so I had to trick myself uh, with, with these kinds of little rules. Give myself a sticker on my, on my calendar. So rules like, I have to do this three times, and I have a streak, but don't break the chain as long as, week after week after week, I have to run at least three times a week. And the run counts until Sunday night. If I leave five minutes before midnight, it still counts as a run for that week. <laughs> <laughs> so I have very strict rules like that, and I also have, have to end where I started, that's another rule. So I cannot only run downhill, that's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to end where I started, it's another rule. I make, uh, make um, rules for myself all the time. So you start with the trigger, then you have a smallest possible habit, and somehow you have to reward yourself until the real reward of the entire practice kicks in. But depending on the kind of practice, that could take, uh, take a while. So where are the many small rewards we make for, mo for small step progress in organizations? Don't tell people to do scrum entirely by the book next week, because maybe that <laughs> might not help. Maybe just start with a stand-up in the morning. That's okay. It's okay. Don't call it scrum. Like, if you only do a walk around the house, that's not a marathon, right? Don't tell, hey, I just did a marathon, <laughs> one kilometer walk. No, no, you're preparing for a marathon. So, so if you're only doing stand-up, it's not scrum, you're preparing to do, to do scrum. Uh, make it rules for yourself, don't make rules for other people. Uh, figure out how these things become, uh, become habits. And uh, that is how we, uh, how we change our behaviors. So recap, everyone wants agility at scale. But nobody knows how to change. It is very, very hard. Um, dealing with changing goals, organizations have to be shapeshifters. I think that uh, uh, metaphor is much better than, uh, than, uh, than others that are, uh, are going around. Uh, I think agility means self-balanced, not self-organized. So it depends on context, right? Sometimes we want self-organization. Sometimes we want somebody to take charge, right? If the ship is sinking, we're not going to dot vote about who is going to leave the ship first, right? We're going to rely on the captain and the captain gives instructions. That's what captains are, are, are taught to do. And the captain will go last and public speakers go first. That's the, <laughs> that's the rule. Um, <laughs> we don't need frameworks. We need fun and uh, fireworks uh, in organizations. And don't make it a rule, make it a habit. And for those of you who just woke up, I have everything in one big slide that tells you how agility scales a large organization, and that's this one. So just take a picture of this, and you can forget everything else that I just said. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day. All right. My mic is on. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Jürgen. Thank you, too. Um, I was looking at the model. We're, we're just off to coffee break, but um, I, w I had a lot of questions popping uh, while oh. listening to you. The model that you showed, uh, the... By, by Yukai Chu, the eight... Yes, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Think, yeah. How many of those can you sort of work on in parallel? So if you're sitting here, you're a manager or an HR yeah. leader or... Oh, uh, he has lots of diagrams in that book where he shows that uh, tools such as Facebook, social network, they basically touch upon all the corners. 
Right? So you can do everything in parallel, but you have to um, w focus on one thing at a time, I'm quite sure. But the yeah. really good products and changes, they, they, they focus on multiple corners of that, of that diagram. So you do not only motivate people with uh, rewards, you also motivate them with a social dimension, mm. you also motivate them with some scarcity, mm -hmm. you also give some meaning, etc. So touch upon multiple so you, points. You yeah. cherry pick and see. Yes. I, is there yeah. any yeah. area which is more is uh, the easier one to, to go for if you're... The easy these ones are at the bottom, <laughs> but right. those are the negative ones. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you don't uh, want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th they are useful. To the better ones are at the top, but they're more difficult. That is the positive, the the, the meaningfulness, uh, etc. Uh, that's why they're at the top because they're positive. The negative ones, like scarcity mm -hmm. and uh, uh, feel it, the fear of missing out. Fear is a is a right. useful motivator for people. The fear of missing out is often used but by, that mo you can do by marketers without basically yeah. doing much else. So if you have an after work, you can limit only yeah. half the company can join. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, thanks a lot. Thank you too. Uh, you they will be able. You you will be able to ask questions during the I panel will be walking because around, yeah. Yeah, and, you're and there's a there. panel, yes. Yep. So, okay. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Thank you too. Wow, another this present. Is for the house for Raoul. Oh, wonderful. And this is for you, <laughs> chocolate handmade. Chocolate, ta -da. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of running. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks. Lots of oh, running. I have made. more running to do, I can see that. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jürgen.